Thank you for taking your time to uh, join me here today. If you're looking for this session on embedded analytics, you've come to the right place. Um, essentially, what the session today is going to be about is the journey that my company, Third Channel, has undergone in actually implementing embedded analytics. So if you're a small company or a small department looking at you know, how an embedded analytics journey might look like, what some of the tips or tricks that you might want to look out for, I hope you find value. So who am I? Uh, my name is Nathaniel Rowe. I hail from Boston, Massachusetts, where apparently my colleagues back home are dealing with the first snow of the year. So in a gesture of solidarity, I put up a picture of some representative Bostonian weather. My journey with Tableau started over 10 years ago. I actually first learned of Tableau when I was a market research analyst. I was doing studies and white papers on the adoption of different BI solutions. And Tableau was one of the many companies we had the privilege of interviewing and seeing a product demo for. I was impressed with their product demo, became a personal user, and I've essentially taken Tableau with me as I've gone on in my career. Specifically for the last four years, I've been working for a small company called Third Channel, a little bit more about them in a minute, uh, as the VP of analytics crafting the analytic products uh, and the vision for the company. And Tableau's been an integral part, both of our internal operations as part of the analyst team, from an operational standpoint for some of the other business units. And as we'll talk about today, eventually client facing, external facing, as part of an embedded analytics solution. So specifically, I'm gonna take just a little bit of time to talk about third channel so you understand the product and the state it was in before we embarked upon this initiative. I'll talk about how we evaluated our business need, identified the opportunity, talk a little bit about the aspects of implementing embedded analytics. Uh, I'll be approaching it more from a product management perspective rather than the nuts and bolts of dashboard design and Tableau server management, for instance. And I'll talk about some of the lessons we learned, both good and lessons we learned the hard way, and how we measured success. Was this a successful in, uh, initiative? What kind of metrics did we use to evaluate that? And if I have enough time at the end, I'll do a quick live example of how it looks in our platform so you have an idea of what embedded analytics might look for you. So with that, Third Channel is an early stage tech startup company from Boston. We were founded in, I think, 2013. And we play in the retail sector. Specifically, one of our goals is to apply all the advanced analytics, the data-centered decision-making that's being used in the e-commerce space and apply it to physical brick-and-mortar retailers. So our clients are brand manufacturers, the companies who make the shoes and the shampoos and the electronics and the widgets that we buy in stores. And the pain point we're specifically trying to solve is they have fantastic product visibility from the moment they conceive of the product to when it's designed and manufactured and shipped out but at the actual point of sale, in most cases, they have to rely on the retailer. They have to trust that the Walmarts and the Best Buys and the Targets are doing right by them. But there's so many stores that carry their products and they don't have a cost-effective way to actually look into those store locations and see what's going wrong. And the retailer isn't incented to send that information to them because especially if they're not doing things correctly, that gives the brand more leverage in their negotiations. So the brand has this vision, they spent all this money on the marketing collateral and the new products and, and it's gonna be a fantastic touch point every time a customer walks in, but we all know the reality is that a lot of things can go wrong. There could be stuff sitting in the back room a store manager never brings out, there could be apathetic store associates, there could just be things that break. But how does the brand know where and when and why? And this is where Third Channel steps in. We've got three core parts of our platform. It starts with what we call our field agent network. Uh, we tap into the uh, <clears throat> quote unquote gig economy. So there's one for any buzzword bingo players out there. Um, and we have 150,000 part-time contractors, pre-vetted, background checked, trained, scattered across the US and Canada. So if a brand needs visibility in all those stores scattered around, we can fire up that network, get them out in the stores, collect data, take action. The core product, which we embed in analytics into, is our field management system. And so this is a web portal, essentially, our clients can log into. They can identify what stores they want to take action in, which agents they want to do, what tasks manage their budget. That's our software platform. And the last pillar, 
which embedded analytics is all about, is this reporting and analytics. How do we take this information that we are collecting along with other data sources and present it back to the client so they can be more intelligent about their resources? And I forgot to mention, part of the field management system also includes a mobile app. So when our agents go into the store and they're taking action, they're constantly collecting data. What does the store look like? What does the store surroundings look like? Has anything changed? Is there renovations going on? Where are your competitors situated? Is there a promotion going on? And these are some of the data points that we need to surface with reporting and analytics. Okay, so that's Third Channel. So our journey with embedded analytics at Third Channel started about 18 months ago. And it started because we were hearing some chatter from our clients that our existing reporting infrastructure wasn't quite meeting their needs. So when we first built Third Channel and our field management system, we did have dashboards, and we still do, but they're very much centered on what the agent is collecting in the store, and very much a one-to-one -one correlation with an observation and some kind of reporting widget. So if an agent goes into a store and says, okay, this is where the product is located, there's gonna be a widget on our dashboard saying, in all the stores that we have visited and we have visibility into, here's the percentage breakdown of where your product is situated. But, and that's great for managing execution and getting some initial visibility, but what we were hearing from our clients is more than just execution metrics, they were really trying to answer three more advanced questions. It's really an optimization problem. They have a finite set of resources, so in the entire universe of stores, which stores should they be visiting? And of all the potential actions that they could take, what is actually going to be the most impactful at those locations or the most needful thing that needs to be done? And ultimately, is it going to make them, to them more money? Can they justify their budget? And can they optimize their budget to increase their sales lift? Easy questions to ask, very difficult ones to answer. In an attempt to answer this, over the years I've been at Third Channel, we've been vastly growing our data network and our data environment. We have information on all those hundreds of thousands of retail locations. We have information on the agents. We have information on what they've observed and the types of actions they've taken. But we wanted to put that in context with the metrics that really drive the client business. So we started ingesting point of sale data. So we got sales numbers for all their products at each individual retail location as quickly and as often as we can get it. In places we couldn't get sales data, we started getting customer traffic data, you know, mobile trace data, so we understand not only how many people are going into different store locations at different times, but what types of people those might be, their profiles and their behaviors. And with this, we were starting to be able to answer these questions, but the impact on our reporting was, well, we didn't build our reporting to support all of this stuff. And then when we layer on predictive modeling and some of our advanced analytics, it wasn't sufficient. So we found ourselves in a position where we were trying to send, or we were sending data to our clients in, in three avenues, none of which were really sufficient. So we had our dashboards. And you know, they worked, and they still do work, for the execution-based metrics. If you're tracking to a budget, we've got all of that in there. If you're looking for a quick percent breakdown, no problem. But when it comes to answering those three questions and that optimization problem, they're either too high level, it's a 30,000 foot view over all the stores, or it was hyper granular. You, know, you can drill down to every single data point, every single picture taken by any of our agents in any of these re uh, retail locations, but who has time to do all that? How do you get the actual insight from that? So that was failing there, and in, in order to get a stopgap measure, we started sending out weekly summaries. So we used some internal resources to comb through the information, highlight trends, patterns, alert conditions that were bubbling up, but maybe our client wasn't aware of, and we started sending those out in weekly emails. But this is very much a stopgap measure. It's manual, it's inefficient, it doesn't scale. Now the sexy analytics, that all happened in quarterly strategic meetings. So every three months, our analyst team would do a deep dive into the data. They'd find the correlations and the, the trends happening in the data. What are the things that are going on in stores that are really moving the needle with sales? Or was this marketing campaign effective in driving this demographic to stores? And we used it to build recommendations for your next quarter. These are the stores we think have the greatest potential for sales. These are the ones that are the chronic underachievers. So you really got to try to fix things there. And this was great. 
So we would present this information to our, uh, to our clients in these quarterly meetings. And actually, this is where Tableau first really comes in, because we were using it internally to create the visuals for these meetings, or using Tableau online to create dashboards that we could walk through live. So these were very well received, but no good deed goes unpunished, because the immediate request is, well, this is too infrequent. You know, yes, we do quarterly budget planning, but we also do monthly budget planning. Can we get this monthly? You know, it'd actually be great to get this bi-weekly so we can pivot more quickly. And when the big client says that in a meeting, it's very easy for sales to say absolutely with a smile and a handshake and tell analytics about it the next day. So this is the situation we were in. None of these really kind of scratched the itch the client really needed. So our leadership came together and we put our heads together and said, Okay, well, we've, we've got an opportunity here, both in terms of potential gains and alleviating current pain points. And some of the ones that we identified were pretty straightforward. Incru improved client satisfaction. There is a feature set our clients want that we currently do not deliver. And if we do, stands to reason they'll be happier and maybe that impacts renewal rates and overall uh, business performance. We also considered that if we add some of these more advanced strategic planning dashboards into our product, maybe that expands our use and stickiness in the organizations. Maybe there's other stakeholders at these brands that will start using our platform that didn't before, and that would make our product more indispensable and stick when it comes to renewal rates. There's also potential for new revenue, because when these clients started asking for the more frequent updates, we said, well, that might actually cost you more. Are you uh, willing to pay? And they said yes. And so if they're willing to pay for this information, this is a potential entirely new revenue stream that we could tap into. And lastly, competitive differentiation. Now, the service industry in retail has been going on for you know, God knows how long. And any of you who have gone into a grocery store and had a smiling associate hand you a cheese sample have in, you know, engaged with this industry but it's really hard to differentiate because there's very small profit margins. You can try to be cheaper than the other companies. You can try to have uh, more trained, more educated, more you know, brand ambassador type people, but then you gotta pay them more. That's gonna hit your profit margin. But our company was all about trying to use data to make our clients smarter, to make them more intelligent and to optimize this problem. So the better we're able to do that, the more we're able to stand out from the pack. So that was something that we could tap into. In terms of pain points, I touched upon some of these already. Low efficiency on creating these reports, a lot of churn. The big one, untenable, unsustainable demand on us poor analysts, that's a huge issue. But we also identified this onboarding issue. For some of our new clients, the first time they really got a taste of some of the advanced analytics we were able to put together, some of our models and projections, wasn't until that first quarterly strategic meeting. And so they had this dead air, essentially, for the first couple months, where they got the execution metrics and they could see us getting up and running, but they really didn't get that oomph, that bang for their buck, until that decision point, you know, three months down the line. And that was something that we were starting to get some feedback that, you know, maybe we could improve upon. So our leadership took a look at this and said, yeah, okay, that's, that's a business opportunity. There's some gains and some pain points here. So obviously the next solution is to have our development team build a full-fledged analytic and visualization feature set within our platform, right? And our development team had a heart attack. And so I jest, I jest, but we didn't immediately jump towards embedded analytics. We first had to get consensus about how we were gonna tackle this problem, how we were gonna deliver these features, and it came down to a classic build versus buy discussion. Now I wanna stress that um, the criteria that we used to make this decision is probably gonna be different from criteria that you know, other companies have. We're a small company and we have certain priorities. But I did wanna list what was impactful to us, the kind of big decision points or the big arguments that were made on both sides of the, the table here. So maybe when you run into them and have these discussions yourself, you're a little better prepared. So in terms of build, argument for build, well, first, native integration to our platform. We had built our software platform from the ground up, and if we were to build a visualization layer in there or improve upon it, then it would have native integration with all the other features. You could click on something in another part of our site, go right to the, the viz, or you could click on the viz and it could send data to the scheduling service in our platform, and, and you would have full control over all that service. We would also own the intellectual property. Now this is a, a concern that's, you know, you know for, for companies that are still not sure where their exit strategy is. 
you know, there's a possibility that an investor might look and say, hey, there's a third company, a third party company that has a product within your platform. What does your platform actually do? It might impact their evaluation of what we do. And so if we build it ourselves, we avoid that problem. Security, always an issue for us in particular. No client should ever be able to see another client's data, particularly sales performance or marketing strategy. We've done a lot of work in the back end to make sure we had segmented and partitioned that data and enforced that security. If we use a third party, can we be sure that that kind of security control is going to persist? And we wouldn't be burdened with licenses and contracts. On the buy discussion, you know, the arguments that we brought to the table, particularly the analyst team uh, and some of the devs who didn't want to build this, um, were fairly powerful in their own right, starting with shorter time to market and lower implementation costs. And we were fortunate enough to actually have a use case to fall back on. We were able to crunch some numbers and actually have a hard example. In 2017, one of our bigger clients uh, contracted with us for a, a big custom project. It was a, it was a little outside our, our normal realm of activity. And we signed on for this, and they asked for a custom dashboard for, to be built for these custom, essentially, KPIs that we were measuring against. And they had some interesting specs. They wanted a speedometer-like dial to show progression completion, and they, they wanted some, some geographic breakdowns. And we said, sure, we'll do this. And so we went through and we executed on this, but we knew exactly at the end of this project how much design resources it took. It took a couple full-time software developers to build this thing. It took a little bit of kind of back-end DBA work to get the tables right. Then we got it up, and then there's the inevitable iterations when the client says, oh, that's not quite what I wanted. So we go through the iteration cycle again, and then once it's up, we have to maintain it. So we took a look at that and said, well, that was very expensive in terms of internal resources. If we use a third party, we don't have to recreate the wheel. From what we understand of the embedded process, we could probably do this very quickly. And even though we're cost, you know, spending money for licenses, compared against the full-time loaded cost of software developers for multiple months, you know, in short term and even medium term, it looked like the buy approach was going to win out. Similarly, faster R&D and, and kind of the easeability the, uh, of scaling. We recognized that we had clients in a lot of different retail sectors. So we have footwear, we have electronics, we have grocery, we have pharmacy, we have convenience, we have pet food. And so no one dashboard is going to meet all those different KPIs. There's inevitably going to be customization above and beyond any customization the clients are going to want. So if we take an approach like using Tableau, and you can build a Tableau dashboard in a day, show it to a client. If they hate it, eh, scrap it, build it up again. Trying to do that the more traditional way with the design cycle and mock-ups is a lot slower. So with an idea of can we fail fast, can we iterate quickly, can we do rapid prototyping, the buy side looked uh, much more attractive. And finally, we had a, a roadmap of already 18 months of tickets that our engineering team was going to work on for features on our core platform. If we can keep focusing on our core competency and not have to recreate that wheel, use and leverage the tools and features of an embedded product, that's just going to help us get the other features out faster. So after this discussion, we did you know, eventually go with the buy route. Um, and I think that it's important to, to focus for us that shorter time to market was probably the biggest one that got the consensus, that got some of those stakeholders on board. And it actually became one of the kind of driving mantras or the, the driving directives of our initiative. And we made a lot of decisions based on, well, we still want to go, you know, we could take a little bit extra time, but no, we're going to focus on time to market. Let's get it out quickly, and then we can iterate from there. So once the decision was made to buy, the next question was, well, which vendor do we buy? Spoiler alert, it was Tableau. But it was a process. We did a bake-off. And again, different companies might have different criteria, but I wanted to focus on the ones that mattered the most to us when we were doing this kind of comparison. And the first most important one was familiarity and training time. So we were already a Tableau shop. We were using Tableau internally in a couple different divisions, but primarily the analytics team and building these dashboards to show to our clients. And if we were going to go with a different platform, well, we'd have to go learn the different platform. We'd have to recreate all those dashboards that we had built in that other tool and figure out how to embed when we had already done some research on Tableau. And because our guiding directive was that shorter time to market, 
it became more, well, is there any other solution out there that has such a compelling case to persuade us to move away from Tableau? So at least that was where we started. And, you know, it was, uh, you know, that familiarity training time, you know, it was, it was a hard question for us to, to uh, move away from. I list cost second because cost was not the most important criteria. And this is interesting. A lot of times when you are trying to advocate for a tool within your own internal organization, you got to go to your CFO or finance officer, you got to build a business case because your company is the one paying out of pocket for all those licenses. Cost oftentimes is the most important criteria in those cases unless you have a particular tech stack and there's some integration uh, compatibilities there that you got to consider. But with embedded analytics, remember, we had already pre-vetted that our clients were willing to pay for this. So we could pass licensing costs through to the client. When we charge them for access to these advanced analytics views, we could bake in that licensing cost in there. We could bake it into our product packaging. So yes, if it was a lower cost, we might have you know, higher profit margins. But it wasn't the deal breaker it often is in these discussions. I do want to say very quickly, if you get to this cost conversation, you're going to have someone in the room raise their hand and say, well, what about Microsoft Power BI? Why don't we go with them? They're so much cheaper. And they are right. Microsoft Power BI is very cheap. But you know, for us, one of the decision criteria, you know, we're a hipster tech startup. We all use Mac laptops. And Microsoft Power BI really likes Windows machines and the Microsoft suite of products. Um, but otherwise, you know, consider if cost isn't your driving directive here, you don't have to go you know, with the cheapest route. You have to consider other things, such as the feature matrix and the current capabilities, but also future proofing. If you're going to do this, you don't want to have to redo it in five years because some other company is now the market leader. So when we were doing our cost compar or feature comparison, we also took into consideration, well, who do we feel most confident is going to be the market leader in five years? And we looked at their research or their, um, their release schedule and their investment in R&D. And we wanted to go with someone we were very comfortable that we wouldn't have to rip and replace. Some of the other criteria, these were deal breakers for some of the other stakeholders, not necessarily analytics. But with an eye towards the user experience, these were the things that were must-haves. The kind of nightmare scenario I kept hearing from some of these other stakeholders was, OK, the client's in our product. They click on a link and they go to a different web page. Or they go to a page in our product that looks completely different from the rest of our platform. Or it has some other company's logo splashed on it and they start wondering, was this like a phishing attack? Am I in some place I shouldn't be? It has to have our brand colors. It has to have our font. It has to fit in with the existing workflows. So any solution that didn't meet that criteria was, was out the door. Security and authentication was a big one because we had a homebrew authentication system set up. It wasn't one of the, the big out-of-the-box ones that you can set up. So would it play nicely with our authentication system and the way we had our data partitioning and the way we had our security set up? And interactivity. We didn't want static, pretty pictures. You know, that's fairly easy to do. We wanted something more. We wanted interactivity, but we didn't want just interactivity within the viz. There's a lot of solutions that do that. We wanted interactivity between the viz and the rest of our platform. Can I do some action on the viz and send that data or send the user to another part of our platform without having inter intermediary steps? And so that was part of our, uh, our criteria. And at the end of the day, we chose Tableau, but we moved away from Tableau Online. And part of the reason was Tableau Online didn't work with the security and authentication the way we quite needed it. We wanted that single sign-on experience, and because we had a custom homebrew authentication system, we were having difficulty there. With Tableau Server, you have some enhanced management features and some configuration options, and we were able to get that to work. So that was the decision that uh, really tipped it between online and server. So that was the decision. And now we get to deployment. So this is a, a very rough deployment roadmap that we, uh, that we set out to do. You know, if you're going to do embedded analytics, well, you got to get the data right, because you're going to build the dashboards on top of that, and then you're going to try to embed it. Now, as I mentioned, we had already used Tableau internally, so we were kind of on step two already. Our analysts had built the data tables the way they really wanted to, and you know, we had the dashboards that we felt were you know, a good first step. We did some work on getting the custom color palettes imported in and changing the fonts and making sure it matched up with the rest of our brand guidelines, but we were already on step two. So 
you know, that was that time to market driving some of our decisions. Again, we are a hipster tech startup, so everything we do is in the cloud. So our deployment of Tableau Server wasn't on-prem, it was to AWS. I don't have much to say here. It was a fairly standard deployment. It, you know, nothing really went wrong. We had to look at the documentation, but it worked very nicely. In terms of the actual embedding, there was a couple approaches that we could have done, done but the kind of time to market driving our decision was, well, let's, let's do the, keep it simple. Let's create a new page on our platform, set up an iframe, have that called a Tableau server, and populate it with a dashboard. Again, some CSS code, and we got that up and running. Probably the most time we spent on the deployment was on that authentication piece, and that was critical, getting that single sign-on. It was very easy for us to get the page, and you'd click on it, and you'd have the Tableau server login information, you know, login page right there, but that wasn't the user flow we were looking for. And so making sure we were passing secure tokens to Tableau server with the authentication credentials, that took us the most time to really sort out to QC, test, and go live. And that was our deployment. In terms of timeline, after our discussions, we got project approval in June 20 of 18. And that was, okay guys, let's go get a Tableau server and see if we can do this. We had a proof of concept live in our staging, uh, staging environment in August. We had lined up three of our customers who were willing to be beta clients, and we had them live in September of 2018. It's just a matter of months we were able to get this out the door. We did have some devs working on this. It was about one and a half devs for about that month. And so we did have a little bit of, you know, took them away from the roadmap for a little bit. But after that, it was almost entirely driven by the analytics team and our product management staff. We had a period of where the beta was live from September to January. We did a full product launch in January to the rest of our clients, and we've launched a 2.0 release in August. Again, time to market was our driving directive here. There are absolutely moments where we could have stepped back and said, okay, we're going to take a little bit more time, perhaps on the design side, polish, make some custom overlays or something like that. But with time to market as our driving directive, this is the timeline we were able to reach. All right. After all that, so obviously everything we did was perfect, and we made the right decision every time. Ah, no, I'm we did learn some lessons and we learned some very quickly. And so probably the first lesson that we learned from beta is that embedded analytics users are users of your platform or your product. They are not Tableau users. And we kind of realized this, we fell into the trap of giving our clients what they asked for, not what they needed, because they saw the, the dashboards that we were presenting on the uh, quarterly strategic planning meetings and they're like, ooh, I want that, I want that. But they were dashboards designed by analysts for analysts for people like this convention who love diving into the data and geeking out over the order of operations of context filters and you know parameter actions. The users of your product are there with a specific workflow and they probably want to spend the minimum amount of time possible. So whatever view you give them has to serve that workflow and it has to be quick and it has to be simple. They saw what we showed them and were like, wow, this is cool, but it's entirely overwhelming. So that was the first thing we learned. The next thing is to improve the onboarding of external users, particularly stakeholders who aren't you know, data savvy or, or analytics users, is you've got to meet them where they are, even if it isn't pretty. Some of the workflows we were trying to disrupt were very much dependent on email and Excel and PowerPoint or literally printouts on a clipboard with a highlighter. So while it's not necessarily dashboard best design practices, we did a lot of data tables and cross tabs so they could look and see something they were familiar with. Oh, that's the data by store with these metrics. That's something I am familiar with. So we did a lot of views that aren't pretty, but were able to feel comfortable to the user. And what you're able to do in that case is, is kind of guide them along. So this is what you're familiar with. Well, then if you click on here, this takes you here, and you're starting to guide them and starting to educate them on some of the more advanced techniques. But if you throw them off the deep end, that's a tough pill to swallow, and that can you know, screw up your onboarding efforts, because if they run into too much frustration too quickly, they're going to give up. So those are probably the two biggest things we learned from the beta of our embedded analytics initiative. So some of the iterations that we focused on between the beta and the full product launch in January was a lot of work in simplifying and streamlining those dashboards. 
Also, it's a very kind of simple, easy feature of Tableau, those uh, view options in the top right, where you can say, oh, well, I am, excuse me, uh, so I'm just interested in the Dick's Boarding Goods in the Northeast. Those are a couple filters. I'm gonna make those filters, set that to Nathaniel's view, make it default when I log in. It's pre-filtered down to that. It's just a couple clicks on filters, but if you can set those views up for your clients, hey, that's two clicks they don't have to do, that's time they don't have to spend, and that's gonna improve the onboarding. So he's did a lot of work with role-based views. Because our whole approach and stand-up was, uh, let's say, a little frenetic, we did a lot of rapid iteration, a lot of prototyping, uh, we actually had to pause for some moments and said, okay, now that we actually have some standard dashboards we're creating, we gotta work on standardizing the data layer and automating the data layer and figuring out the refresh schedule. What is the refresh schedule we need? What do our clients need to see and how frequently? And making sure we're supporting that. So it's at this point that we started addressing the data layer again. And this is where we started playing with the JavaScript um, API for Tableau because we wanted to start getting that interactivity between the viz and uh, the rest of our platform. There's a lot more that we can do, and it's on our, our to-do list to do here, but some of the simple things like scanning Tableau Server and putting up thumbnails of all the dashboards they have access to see, that was a very easy win. Uh, pushing data, you know, creating a button to push data from the viz into our scheduling system was another, and some ways that they could link to the views from other parts of our platform. So those were the iterations that we did before our product launch, and then we went from the three beta clients and we started rolling it out to the rest of our clients, or at least offering it to the clients, and started producing these as, as quickly as we could. And so when you have more clients, you have more voices, you start to doing that first big step in scaling up, and so the first thing we learned here was any flaws in your data ingestion or ETL pipeline, you're gonna find <laughs> those pain points darn quick. And where possible, absolutely try to fix those if they are within your control. What we struggled with a little bit is we relied on external data providers for a lot of our data. A lot of different retailers we're getting data from, they each have their own format, their own cadence, and sometimes we, they're two weeks behind because they have their own issue. Now when you have an internal team, if an analyst goes in and says, huh, you know, I, I'm, I'm missing two weeks of data here, they're usually, you know, there's people they can talk to, they find out why, they take it into account, they work on something else. Even if it's internal, like an operational dashboard, you can kind of send out an email and say, hey guys, sorry, our sales reporting is, is, is down at the moment. And you have a little bit more wiggle room. But if you're presenting it to external clients who are paying money for access to this data, how do you deal with that issue? And that's where transparency is the key. So how do you present on the dashboard how current the data is, any potential flaws in the data in a way that's able to be read by a business user, not an analyst, and so they can understand the context, margin of error, for instance, understand the context so they can make the correct decisions. So we did some work in redesigning the dashboards just to have tool tips with some kind of custom code that would pull in date fields and stuff like that, just so they would have all the information on their fingertips so they didn't run into a situation where they loaded a dashboard, saw a timeline view, stopped two weeks ago, and immediately jump on the phone and start calling us. So that's something to consider. Now the driving directive of our project, that time to market, I don't have any real regrets about. I think we got some really quick wins. But the one piece that I think we could have taken a little bit more time on was on that data schema side. We kept things simple, we kicked some cans down the road, well, we don't wanna bring in this data source just yet, hopefully we don't need to. And unfortunately, at, after we went live, we found some reasons that we had to bring in these, these data sources, we had to change the schema. And if any of you have had to deal with uh, changing a database that has multiple internal dependent dashboards, you know that pain and you know that friction. It's scaled up when you have those paying external clients. And so I wish we had spent a little bit more time perhaps over-engineering the data schema and potentially trying to think of, of exception cases because when you gotta change that database and you've got a dozen clients all relying on it, that's a huge time sink and it's a huge headache. So after we launched in, uh, in January, we did uh, release a, a 2.0 in August with some kind of facelift and some improvements. And I wanted to address a couple points that aren't necessarily analyst team focused or, or Tableau dependent, but were important parts of our journey. So, hey, 
congratulations, you've got an embedded product. Way to go. How are you gonna market around this? How are you gonna package it? How are you gonna price it? Is it gonna be based on seats? Is it gonna be based on, on you know, data sources? Is it gonna be based on number of visits? How are you gonna to talk to your clients about this? And this has impact on the analyst team, so hopefully you have a voice in these discussions. Um, but this is an important step to take. For instance, in our case, because it was very well received by our clients, we made the decision not to make embedded analytics a separate product that we would tack on. We said for all new clients moving forward, we're gonna do some very basic, canned, repeatable views embedded in the platform with a set number of, of just a few licenses so the clients start off with these views. This hopefully will get them used to engaging with the data in this manner and will help those upsell our conversations. Hey, you like this view? Look what we can do when we get your sales data. Makes those conversations a lot easier to have. But of course, that has impact on the analyst team because now we're gonna have to support and we have an idea of the scale we are going to support it at. Stability, stability, stability. This goes back to the ETL ingestion pipeline. It goes back to your database tables, figuring out how you're updating and refreshing it, making sure it's not sequential, so you know one failure crashes the whole thing. Do whatever you can, because at this point, you're probably getting SLAs and uptime requirements from your clients, and so you have to spend a lot of time on that. Documentation and support. When you're doing rapid prototyping, oftentimes documentation falls by the wayside. You're more concerned with getting the next version out than you are documenting exactly how to replicate that process. But if I go to the high stakes poker table and win $10 million and resign tomorrow, can this initiative go on? Do I have critical knowledge that only I know and I'm walking out the door with it? You've gotta make sure you document the steps to maintain and repeat this process and set up a support network. You know, if they have a question, if they have an issue, if something breaks and the client needs support or help, what is the process around that? And you're probably gonna have to scale your analyst team. Now, one of the reasons we did embedded analytics in the first place was there was a huge demand on the analyst team and we were gonna have to scale up to meet that demand. But I think the key thing here is you're not scaling linearly. We're not just hiring people to replicate reports and refresh reports every couple of weeks for clients. We were able to target specific uh, job roles and skill sets, somebody to look and monitor over the ingestion in ETL pipeline, somebody to, as a data steward over the database, another data scientist to work on the data models. And the benefit here is if you're at this stage, you know, this might be paying for itself already, which is a fantastic position to be in when you're making an argument for these headcounts. So those are some of the things that we were addressing after product launch to the version 2.0. And the last kind of word of wisdom I wanna leave you with is, well, train your customer success team or your account reps, whatever you call them, so they can train your customers. If they are the point of contact, that interaction point between you and your clients, they have to be knowledgeable about Tableau, the functionality, how it fits within your platform. This is important in any organization, building up that internal roster of champions and, and Tableau users just internally. But when you're client facing, this becomes an issue of scale. When we first did the kind of beta versions and the product launches, all the, the initial client training involved a couple product managers or the analysts who knew those feature sets really well. But as we're rolling on more clients and hopefully signing on a lot more, we need to have those points of contact with the clients being able to handle those interactions. All right, was this a successful initiative? So if you remember back when we first identified the business needs, we laid out some ideas around potential gains and internal pain points that we were trying to address. We use these as metrics at the end I mean, we're not at the end, but if we look backwards, we're using these metrics to now evaluate whether or not we accomplished what we set out to do. Customer satisfaction. We got those new features live in under six months and in our clients' hands. I've been in this industry a while. I was very pleased and very happy that we were able to do it so quickly. And we are able to have our clients answer those three critical questions in ways they were never able to before. I have a whole host of potential examples, uh, but the one uh, that always comes to mind makes me chuckle is this, and, and bear with me, it requires a little setup. So we have a client who does luxury sunglasses, right? And for them, a huge part of their business happens at the optometrists. 
So if you remember last time you went to get an eye exam, you got your eye exam, you came out, there's those big walls of all those frames and sunglasses. That's where a lot of their sales happen. But those stores don't have the infrastructure to pass sales data and inventory data back to the brand very quickly. Oftentimes there's like a month or two month lag until they get the next order for product uh, shipment. And that's all the information they have on how well these different locations are doing. So there's this time gap between what's happening in the store and when the brand knows about it. And so this client of ours sent out their you know, seasonal list of new products and they have their top sellers and et cetera, et cetera. And they sent out one particular SKU which was described as um, extra. It was big, it was bright, it had sequins, it had LEDs, it was over the top. And they only sent a couple of these units out to store locations because the buyers of these have to be very confident in their own fashion identity to actually walk out in the street with these. And so they were expecting it to be more of a feature piece and, and not really a seller. So third channel agents go into these stores. One of the tasks they do is recording out of stock events. And so highlighted in our dashboards, all of a sudden we start seeing red dots pop up. All these store locations are getting some out of stock alerts because our agents are going in and verifying it during that time gap when the systems don't talk to each other. We go in, we sort product. Hey, this product is the one that's most frequently out of stock. They're able to see this as it's happening. They're able to do a little research. And lo and behold, Rihanna had shown up at a red carpet movie premiere wearing these sunglasses. So there's a run on this product. And they're able to go to their warehouses, send out the remaining stock to these locations. They're able to fire up another production run while the iron is hot, so to speak. And so that's just one example of being able to answer these questions, surface it to our clients in enough time for them to take action and capture those sales. New product revenue, absolutely. All of the beta clients still use in, uh, embedded analytics. We are rolling out the, those basic views to all of our new clients and older clients as they hit the renewal period. But 50% of them have gone from that base package to one of the more premium packages and upgrade, uh, upgraded, which has a higher price tag, which is a fantastic thing for us. Increased use and stickiness. We didn't hit this one. We didn't see fantastic you know, usage numbers and, and more people logging in and, and more sessions. Our, our traffic to our site didn't you know, go through the roof and that was a little bit of a disappointment. It's a little harder to measure but at least in the kind of qualitative feedback we collected by talking to our clients, we found out while the quantity of engagement didn't increase, the quality increased. So their previous workflow when they were doing their monthly or their quarterly planning involved a lot of other systems and pulling data, putting them in spreadsheets and sorting and using that to develop their strategy. And then they'd take that information and go into our system, plug it in and execute. So they were still going to our system, but they were going into it earlier in the workflow and they were using these visualizations to help make those strategic decisions. So we didn't see you know, fantastic usage numbers, maybe the time was up a little bit more, but that quality of engagement, I hope, is going to indicate increased stickiness, even if the, the web traffic metrics don't bear that out. In terms of pain points, time to onboard clients. Remember there was that dead air for a couple months before that big quarterly strategic meeting. It now takes us about one week to build, embed, authenticate, and go live for a new client. Most of that is configuration, talking with the client, figuring out what KPIs matter to them, what metrics they're going to measure against, what their goals are, and that'll tweak some of our dashboard settings and parameters before we go live. So that's a fantastic win there. Efficiency in creating reports. Most of our manual weekly reports being sent out have been replaced by real-time dashboards. The most extreme example of time saved I was able to find when I was doing some research it was one poor gal at our organization spent about a day to a day and a half every week, or Monday and a little bit of Tuesday, going in, pulling data from different parts of our system, scrolling through all the activity reports and all the different stores that were visited, grabbing images, plugging some of the data into an Excel sheet, creating some graphs, putting it in a PowerPoint, sending it out. It took her, you know, like I said, eight to 12 hours a week. We're able to replicate most of this in real-time dashboards. You go in, spend five minutes with a filter, and you get all that information. So that's a, that's a pretty good percentage decrease in, uh, in time spent. Uh, not everything was that impressive, but that's a good example. Now I know you're all holding your breath for the most important metric. Did the demand on us poor, beleaguered analysts de decrease? 
happy to report that it did. We do a ticket tracking system and we're able to identify what tickets assigned to the analyst team are coming from ad hoc or you know, unplanned sources. And since we're able to put these dashboards in the hands of our clients, put it in the hands of our customer success team who can help our clients, they're able to answer their own questions. And so we saw a spot of a 60% reduction in the ad hoc analysis. All right, let's go to a demo. This is just a very simple uh, demo environment that we set up. So that's third channel, we log in. So there's no actual activity data here. But as you can see, this is our web portal. Um, left hand nav with a lot of different options for the client to go in and engage on their projects and stores and budget. And so one of the things we set up just in the management interface is a very simple toggle. I think you can see it. Do we enable advanced analytics? Toggle it off, that page doesn't exist in the navigation, toggle it on, it does create the iframe and the connection to the server link. So just with a simple toggle, when I'm uh, onboarding a new client and configuring um, their program, that's all you need to do. A little above, you can set the path. Where in the Tableau server directory are, am I going to point and I'm going to look? Very simple drop down, scans Tableau server, gives you the options there. So then, when you go into reports, we have other reporting. We have our critical alerts, we have general details about activity, place to download the data, and fitting nicely in here is the advanced analytics option. It won't appear if we turn that toggle off, but if you click on it, then it makes that handshake. That's where the single sign-on happens. I have already authenticated into our system, and so our authentication service sends a secure token to Tableau server. If I am not authorized, I'll have a handy message here saying contact my third channel representative for more information, but I am authorized. And so I see these views. And what it's also done is scan through the directory we set to say, based on your user permissions and the group role that you have, what are the views that you can see? There might be other views enabled for power users or sales or some internal people, but for my user settings, I can see two of them. They show up in this particular manner, and if you click, calls to Tableau server, creates the iframe, and in a couple moments, it'll populate it with data. And you have the fully featured Tableau interface right here. We made some decisions for all of our clients currently. We do not enable web edit capabilities. We could, but again, we have to keep in mind what our user role is. If we start servicing users that are high-end analysts and want that capability, we could absolutely do that, but for the moment, we restrict the, uh, the ability for them to monkey around and change with the views. It's also a stability issue. And so that's pretty much what it looks like. You can navigate back, select a different view. There's some other, in some other of the live programs, we have some additional features that I unfortunately can't show off because it uses live data, but this is what it looks like, very simple. All right. And that is what I have for you today. Um, we have a little extra time. Um, if you have any questions uh, specifically about implementation details or some of the other things that you might be struggling with at your organization, by all means send me an email or, or meet me afterwards. Um, happy to talk shop anytime, any day. And uh, of course, you know, if you have a moment, please evaluate the presentation, let me know how I did. That's all I have for you. Thank you very much.